uh, because you're going to put, you guys know most of your engineers, right? Raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> Don't admit it. <laughs> Jeez, I'm not either, but no, um, chemical, it doesn't count. Your <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're, you're, you're trying to make something here that should work perfectly fine and well, and then you put it out there to everyone on the market, and you get how many complaints? This didn't work. I stuck my fingers in it. It's a blender. What'd you do that for? <laughs> okay, now I got to make a safety. Things that you would think that no one in their right mind to do, you got to make it safe so they can do it. I was going to drive this car, and I'm like, guys, in your right mind, would you put lithium-ion batteries in this with me driving the car? And then Nate goes, no. Everything I was telling the guys is like, guys, everything else that always took us out of events when we were in college and we did the mini Baja and stuff like that, something broke. Okay? It wasn't that the car didn't work, it just broke. You know, the cars that finished, there were only like five or six cars that would finish. Some of them were real nice and the others looked like not so nice, but they didn't break. It doesn't have to look good, it's just not got to break. So that's what we were aiming for. Uh, that and primarily drivetrain efficiency. Drivetrain efficiency is number one. A lot of the guys, a lot of the other teams said, it's weight and then aerodynamics. And I'm like, well, sort of. Only if you've given up on your drivetrain efficiency. If you assume you've got an internal combustion engine that's never going to get more efficient, and you're driving in town driving, sure, it's weight. But you're, you're already assuming that you're never going to get more than 30% efficient if you're going to burn your engine up during a race. Kind of like a NASCAR or IndyCar. It's good for one race, maybe about 30% efficient. And because they're running at that efficiency, it's running really hot, really lean, putting out a lot of power, and it's good for one race out of 1,000 miles. Uh, our drivetrain now is right about 92% efficient. I don't care what you do if you're 30% efficient at the engine, not at the wheels. We're 92% efficient at the wheels. We can be heavy. We can be less aerodynamic, and we're still going to beat you. The guy that actually won, only takes it only takes his car 3.5 horsepower to move it at 50 miles an hour. It takes us about five and a half. The difference is he's using a 30% efficient IC engine. Not 30% at the wheels. Let's just say it's overall 30% though. He's going to have to put out about 12 horsepower to get, or burn up 12 horsepower of fuel to get his 3.5. We have to burn up about 6 horsepower of fuel to get our 5. So although we're bigger and heavier, and we should take almost twice as much energy to move us at 50 miles an hour, which we use, he's the half as much energy actually to sustain us. trying to figure out, we're like, okay, well, we need an ellipse here. We want a teardrop. The front of that's just an ellipse, and we need it to taper off at about 1 to 4 for a 60 mile an hour speed to be most efficient. A little quicker than that if you're going slower. High speed cars you see out do on the salt flats are really long, because the faster you go, the more time you got to get the air to collapse in along your tail. Um, so what we did to get that curve is we're sitting there and I'll go, okay, we need a lips with a certain rise and run, and how do we do that? I'm like, I remember how to do a circle from, like, first grade. It's a string, you know, and a pencil, and a, wait, the, isn't the lips like two dots and a string? And so we started with that, where you had cardboard, and like, well, that doesn't hit where our steel is on here. we got to make it bigger. It's like, well, we need about two more inches here, so that's, do you double the length of the string? No, it's, wait, it's some ratio of the length between the points and the... How about we just make it longer and try it again, and try it again, and oh, there it is, and we, we finally got where we wanted to, I'm like, okay, well, let's measure that rise and run, and it came out perfect for the teardrop front end, we're like, okay, it's not going to be perfect time we're done, because now we have to make that curve, at least we can start out with the right curve, and we took that cardboard curve, laid it on some plywood, cut out the plywood, bolted that plywood down to our welding table, threw some half-inch steel on our, our wood-burning stove, once it got glowing orange, grabbed it with the end on the welding gloves, put it on the table and had a wet rag there. We just bent it around the board on the table and kept clamping it down and hammering it around to get the shape that we needed. While another guy had a wet rag and he's trying to put the wood out and the smoke's coming up and you can hardly see what you're doing. And we did that six or eight times and we tried to get two that would match. And those two is 
these two matched, and then these two matched, then these two matched, and then these two matched. Because if you didn't have them matching, both sides would be even more different than they are. And then what we did is we took high density foam and we cut it and we put it between the steel. You can see that's what's solid between them. The trussing here, we did that up here too. And we put two layers of fiberglass on it. Well, that's how we built the whole car. And then we came back and we used a high density spray foam on the rest of it. The whole thing, there's a, we call it the baby book in there. It's a little green book of pictures in it. The whole thing looked like a giant rice krispie treat. And we started, we took hand saws and graters and, and, and files and sandpaper and started shaving it down and shaving it. And there's like three or four of us working on it. We're trying to keep the car the same on all sides. You know, I said, if you hit steel, you've gone too far. Okay. And we had to patch up a couple spots. And then once we got that the shape we wanted to, then there were a bunch of holes in places because it's expanding foam. And we filled those with uh, drywall mud and let that dry. You can... <laughs> well, if you think about it, we only needed to fill the space. We didn't need anything that was structural at that point because we're putting fiberglass over it. You needed something that you could sand down where you wouldn't be sanding down the foam and change the shape. So you had to fill all these little holes to support the fiberglass. So we used drywall mud. We could patch it and sand it down all in a day and start putting the fiberglass on it. And we were in a race and we were putting, we put like $12,000 in this car. We all had day jobs, so we're doing this from, Nate and I would get there at about 6 or 7 o'clock at night, we'd work till 4 in the morning, then we'd go home, sleep for two hours, and go to work. And we'd do the same thing the next day, the next day, the next day, or call in sick and do it the next day, the next day, and the next day. Uh, Dad was there for weeks at a time. George, who was almost retired, was doing the same thing. We had some other guys, Josh there, Thomas, where's Thomas at? Thomas runs his own shop, and then after working his 16 hours at his own automotive shop, then would come out and work some hours at our shop, and then go to work at his shop again. You know, one man business, you gotta work what, you, you, you pick your hours, so you work all of them. fenders can you jump up and down on and they don't flex, especially on an ultra-efficient vehicle. I mean, we're getting 200 miles to the gallon. 207. So, so probably if you had exotic body work, you'd probably take another couple hundred pounds off. We could take another few hundred pounds out, but the point was to also make a consumer viable, production-ready vehicle. Now, this would be a nice prototype. It's not really production-ready, but we can demonstrate that it's solid. Tell me. Uh, so we fixed those problems, got back to knockout, and we did everything that, that they that we told them we could do. Uh, but the time we did the acceleration event, the clutch started slipping that morning. So the first time I did acceleration, it was a little slow on the zero to 60, and it didn't get any better from that. The, the clutch, they, uh, who was out there? Uh, National Geographic was out there, and, and part of their show, which is only released in Canada unless you go to see it on YouTube, uh, you, they were filming us at the, the start line for the acceleration event and you could hear the clutch outside the car. It sounded like something really bad, squealing and howling and burning up. And I was just like, oh, wow, I couldn't hear that inside at all. Well, probably because Metro's don't have 200 forms. Actually, it was a race clutch specifically designed oh. for this and a specific, especially made uh, flywheel. It was designed to handle the uh, 200 horsepower. It just couldn't also handle the torque. And it, it had other issues. There are a lot of manual transmissions that cannot, they aren't designed to handle the torque loading from an electric oh, motor. Yeah, electric there are other teams out there that had yeah. similar issues. Uh, there's a guy, Jack uh, Rickards in Missouri. He's got EV, or is the owner of EVTV. Does all kinds of electric car conversions. And he was doing really well, and we were talking back and forth with him, and he has a similar system. He has the same controller and one size smaller motor. And he has it in a 57 replica Porsche, I think it was. Um, and he goes, well, guys, I haven't had any problems with mine. It's actually a Mini Cooper Clubman. Mini Cooper Club. Okay. So this winter he took it out because he's like, okay, well, let's take it out. Let's check all the connections. Let's do this. Let's do that. 
His clutch was burnt up just like ours. The whole thing was purple. And he had twisted his coupling shaft, which was made out of 4175, some type of aircraft steel, specially made for him. Ours was made out of like 2021 steel. We made a flywheel that we could weld up to a 40 millimeter taper fitting that uh, uh, as a Dodge fitting. Um, and it worked just fine, just the clutch did. And once we bolted everything together, it worked fine. But we kept the, the friction disc because it has the springs in it. And since we had a special race disc, it had stronger springs in it. You'll hear it out here. If we hit, get on it harder, regen harder, you can hear it dunk, 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 dunk on the springs. We tried to turn it by hand or by putting a bar on it this winter when we had it out of the car and we couldn't do it. We're like, wow, those springs are tight. You get in the car and you just touch the gas. You go, dunk, 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 dunk. It's like, that's a lot of torque it's applying to it. Uh, but it hasn't broke yet. So, uh, and other teams, uh, other, other people, I should say teams, uh, some teams in the, in the X Prize uh, at other events, other colleges and stuff have had similar problems. And we've told them, hey, this is what we did and it works. And some of them go, well, we want to keep a clutch. Okay, good luck. Uh, right before ours burnt up, uh, the driver for Zap came over and talked to us. Al Unser Jr. was the driver for Zap. At the shakedown event, it, Zap was in a different class than us. We're in the mainstream class. We've got to sit, seat four adults, have four wheels, get at least 100 miles per gallon and have a 200 mile range. There were two alternative classes. Alternative classes seat two, 100 mile range instead of 200 and get 100 miles per gallon. And they could be side by side or in line. They broke that down into two separate uh, alternative class categories. They were in the side by side alternative. And he came over and he talked to us a bit and said, so what, what type of transmission do you have? And we told him, he goes, oh, good luck with that. And I'm like, why do you say that? He goes, well, we used to have a, manual transmission in ours too and uh, I hadn't changed it after the last event. Well, why is that? And he goes, they're real tricky to shift. And I'm like, oh, crud. <laughs> I thought it was just me. <laughs> and uh, basically, yeah, it was real tricky to shift. It didn't want to shift. You had to stop, put it in a gear, drive. You could start from zero in any gear you wanted, first through fifth. So it didn't really matter, except you started a lot faster in first gear, and you had a lot higher top end in fifth, but the electric motor could handle it. Uh, we, this winter, we took everything out of the transmission and left just third and fourth. It took the first out, first, second, and fifth. Um, we're actually... Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's a switch on the, on the dash. Um, basically, this is a, a direct drive, two-speed selectable transmission. You select the speed and you stop. If you think of it as a column shifter for shifting the electric motor, I'm going to lie to you because you're, you're, everyone's more familiar with the lie, and then I'll tell you the, the part to fill in. On a column shifter, it starts out in park, reverse, neutral, drive. We don't have neutral. We have econo, so it's park, reverse, econo, drive. Econo sucks. No one drives it in econo. You do that on the track if you're trying to get high mileage. You can actually meet the accelerations and that kind of stuff, and it prevents you from flooring it. And drive, it's a lot more fun. And that's the way we drive it all the time. It's got manual brakes, manual steering, but it has regen brakes, regenerative braking on it, which uh, on the EPA test, they recovered over 16% of the braking energy through the regen. Uh, the difference... You said you had regen at one point we did, and we tried to design and build our own, and they didn't work. They were really strong, but didn't produce much energy. So we got rid of them. It was more trouble than it was worth. Um, for this vehicle, if we could get functioning ones, there's a, there's a uh, I can't remember the name of the company right now, some guys from MIT that graduated about a year year ago made some hydraulic um, regenerative structs. Our, ours were electrical. We just had uh, magnets, a coil, Coil, booster, magnets, make power, dampens you. Well, it's supposed to make power. It didn't work that great. Um, they made hydraulic ones, which go through a small hydraulic tube over to a little turbine, which spins a little electric motor, and you create electricity. Uh, you think it's real difficult. I thought so, too. And I'm like, oh, it's complicated. You got this, and you got that. They've got a really nice, clean system. It's, it's, it's production quality now. You can order what you want for your vehicle. In a, in a car that weighs about 3,000 pounds, they say it will recover about 1 to 1.9 kilowatts, kilowatt hours, which isn't a lot necessarily for your SUV. It's only like 2 or 3 horsepower, and you're using 27, 30 horsepower to move down the road. We only use 6, and we're recovering almost 3 if we get those shocks.